According to St. Mark, reading from the third chapter, beginning with the 20th verse. Jesus went home, and the crowd came together again so that they could not even eat. When his family heard it, they went out to restrain him, for people were saying, He has gone out of his mind. And the scribes who came down from Jerusalem said, He has Beelzebul, and by the ruler of the demons, he casts out demons. And he called them, he called them to him and spoke to them in parables. How can Satan cast out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. And if a house is divided against itself, that house will not be able to stand. And if Satan has risen up against himself and is divided, he cannot stand, but his end has come. But no one can enter a strong man's house and plunder his property without first tying up the strong man, and then indeed the house can be plundered. Truly I tell you, people will be forgiven for their sins and whatever blasphemies they utter, but whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit can never have forgiveness, but is guilty of an eternal sin. For they had said, he has an unclean spirit. Then his mother and his brothers came, and standing outside, they sent to him and called him. A crowd was sitting around him, and they said to him, Your mother and your brothers and sisters are outside asking for you. And he replied, Who are my mother and my brothers? And looking at those who sat around him, he said, Here are my mother and my brothers. Whoever does the will of God is my brother and sister and mother. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Please be seated. Grace be unto you and peace from God our Heavenly Father and from our Lord and our Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen. Have you ever done anything crazy? I have been accused of that. I've been said to have done crazy things, including something like parachuting. And at the time, I didn't think it was crazy at all. I thought it was very exciting until the moment to jump out of the airplane came. And then I wondered. But there have been moments in my life, indeed, when I have been called crazy, or I know very well that people think that I was a bit crazy. Even growing up, my uncles and aunts had a very difficult time with me. I was, I was the odd nephew. I had been well-educated, I had done some really strange things like going to far-off lands, and worse, worst of all, I was a pastor. And as you all know, it's impossible to speak to pastors. My family thought I was strange on a number of occasions. When I was, when I was young, teenager, one of the things that the boys used to do was to climb this big FM radio tower that was on the prairies. It was huge, it was tall, went up into, almost into the clouds, and it was the thing that we would do, mostly because it impressed the girls, or so we thought. Now, I did this a couple, two or three times, actually, and uh, I was scared to death. But I had to do it because all the other guys were doing it. I had to do it because I wanted to have some credibility with the girls, all of whom thought I was quite strange. And so I climbed this tower with the other boys. Now, what you don't know about these towers is that when they're that high, it looks like it's a, an arrow sticking straight up out of the ground. But once you get up there, it starts waving back and forth. You can't see it from the bottom, but I swear it was going like three feet in either direction. and, and it was, it was awful. Now, I had to get over my nausea and everything else by the time I got to the ground, but it was kind of crazy. And I stopped doing it after my dad found out. Now, the worst thing in the world that could happen when you live in a small town is if the pastor finds out that you're doing a dumb thing, and especially if the pastor is your father. And he said, are you out of your mind? And I said, well, everybody was doing it. He said, that's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. He said, on top of that, if you ever want to have children, you better not be doing that again. I stopped doing it, having been scolded by Pastor Simons. The other time that I remember most poignantly when it came home to roost 
about this feeling that I was being called crazy was when my family and I were called to serve in Africa. And I've told you this before, but I knew that there would be a variety of you know, expressions about the whole business, but they knew that I traveled a lot, and so nobody was terribly freaked out. But when I went to my brother, I was thinking about him in this context today. Today would have been his birthday. He would have been 57 years old. And when I went to him and said to him, I was expecting congratulations. I was expecting something supportive. But what he said to me was, and I quote, are you nuts? He said, why in heaven's name would you want to take your wife and a small baby to the middle of nowhere? And to top it all off, just to rub it in a little bit more, he said, are you not capable of finding a job here? <laughs> Sometimes in our lives we do things that create a mystique or something or a challenge in people's thinking that prompt them to believe of us that we are out of our minds, that we are crazy. But there are some things that are worth taking the risk for. Now in our text today, we hear a story, and we need to be very clear on this, where people had come to the conclusion, particularly the leaders of the religious community, that Jesus was in fact crazy. That he was losing his marbles. And what made this whole business even worse is that his family began to believe them. And they began to try to usher Jesus off the stage. You know, come on Jesus, let's go now. You don't need to be doing this. Because he was doing things that challenged the norms. He was doing things that challenged the way in which people understood life should be lived according to the law. Now, two things in particular one can underscore here as being very important. First of all, he was healing people. Now, on the surface of it, you'd say that's a good thing to do, but Jesus was healing people in a way that the religious leaders thought was rather indiscriminate because you can't just heal everybody. Can you? Jesus said, of course, everybody, without exception. Jesus healed people who were considered to be ritually impure, unclean. He healed people excuse me, who were considered to be possessed by demons. He healed people who had leprosy. He healed people who were born blind. He healed people who were crippled. He healed everyone who the religious community had found ways by their rules to exclude. Jesus was gathering them all in and offering healing and love and forgiveness to the lot of them. And they were saying of him, he has an unclean spirit. It's only Satan that could heal all these people like this. Only Satan can cast out Satan. And of course, you heard Jesus' response to that. He said, if a kingdom is divided against itself, it cannot stand. Jesus was accused because of his concern for the entire community. He was accused of being out of his mind. And his family began to believe him. They tried to restrain him because he kept doing this weird stuff. Now, beyond that, Jesus was saying of people that these people who are called upon to be my followers are indeed my brothers and sisters, my mother. And you have to understand this from the context in which we hear this story. Family in that day was so very, very important. For me, I've come to learn this having had experience of overseas cultures. Many cultures overseas view family differently than we do. We have a very tight sense of nuclear family sometimes. But very seldom do we have a sense of the importance of the extended family. Now, in that place, in that day and age, similar to what you would experience perhaps in Africa or parts of Asia, your brother and your sister was anybody with whom you had a close blood connection. Your cousins become your brothers and your sisters. And this is no joke because they will come and they will live with you and they will stay with you. And your mother, above all else, your mother was a person who was revered as having given you life and having raised you. And the one person in the world that you would never ever tolerate being hurt or abused or in any way maligned is your mother. 
And to this, Jesus is now saying, who are my mother and my sisters and my brothers? And he looks around him at the people who are listening to the preaching of God's word, to this notion of how it is we must reinterpret the law. And he's saying, these people, these ones that are doing God's will, these people are truly my mother and my sisters and my brothers. Do you remember from last week we spoke about kind of a new interpretation of the law, a new but old interpretation of the law. For Hebrew, the Hebrew understanding, the Jewish understanding of the law was that its purpose was to help us live a better life. And this is where it becomes counterintuitive to help us live a better life by directing us to the need of the neighbor. Now for us, the law provides for us the possibility of right living, the possibility of avoiding chaos, doing the right things to protect me, to protect my stuff. But the Hebrew way of thinking was this, that if I'm looking out after the goods and the needs and the life of my neighbor, and my neighbor is likewise doing that for me. It's not just me, single me, looking after my stuff, whether or not the law is on my side, but it's me and my neighbors looking after my stuff, as just as much as me and my neighbors are looking after his stuff and her stuff and their stuff. It becomes a community effort so that the law is designed to provide a good life for people on the premise the care for the neighbor, the needs of the neighbor. Jesus was simply doing that. Because sometimes we have the proclivity, the tendency to make the law into something that is its own end. Rather than looking at the needs of the neighbor, the needs for which the law had been intended to provide counsel, the law itself, followed in a wooden sort of way, is misused. If the rules don't help the neighbor, we misuse the rules. If the rules don't help us to give life to people, we misuse the rules. And this was the message of Jesus. And this message of Jesus, because he pushed it in the face of universal disagreement, even his family said he was crazy. Now, brothers and sisters, Despite the fact that 2,000 years have passed since Jesus walked this earth, we still have a tendency to look at the rules as being more important than that which the rules were lifted up to protect. We tend to look at the rules, the principles by which we live as being more important than the things they were designed to provide life to. Jesus calls upon us today in the same way that he called upon the people in his community in his day to take care of the neighbor. That we fulfill the, the exigencies of the law by taking care of the needs of our neighbors. Now we live in a particular demographic here in a particular neighborhood where those needs are not profoundly evident. We live with relative comfort. We don't see a whole lot of hardship. But I would... Uh, suggest to you that if you don't see hardship, you're not looking hard enough. There are people around you, there are people in this room who are this very day suffering. Suffering for any number of reasons. And it might not be simply lack of material goods or lack of food, lack of basic things, but lack of love. People who are alone in this world, who have no one to turn to, and they sit beside us, not saying a word to us, and rather than reaching out in love to them so that they know that they're part of God's family, we leave them alone. There are people in this room and beyond who are suffering because of any number of things, some of which the Stephen Minister cited as reasons, as reasons for Stephen Ministry. Loss of family, loss of health, loss of job, any number of issues make us feel as if we are separate from one another, separate from those around us. We, brothers and sisters, have a calling. We have a calling as followers of Jesus to be God's hands and feet in the world. If there are people in this world who need to be hugged by Jesus, 
And you can imagine that there are, because all, all of us, from time to time, really could benefit from a hug from Jesus. If there are people in this world who have a need for a hug from Jesus, guess what? You've got to be the one doing the hugging. It's on you to do the hugging because Jesus has given you this privilege of reaching out in love to your brothers and sisters. You all know that that's a particularly hard thing for me to do, but it is nonetheless a call that we all have. Jesus calls upon us to love one another. So my challenge to you is to go out from this place today, recognizing that the law that we have, the law that's before us, provides for us the possibility of reaching out in love to God's children, to our neighbors. And that doesn't mean the neighbors that we like, the neighbors that are close, the neighbors that look like us, the neighbors that eat the same food as us. It doesn't mean that. It means all of them, without exception. The healthy, the whole. The unhealthy, the imperfect, the impoverished, the possessed, the sinners. All of them are our brothers and sisters for whom Jesus died and people for whom we need to reach out in love. So, brothers and sisters, there is a risk if you live your life this radically that somebody's going to call you crazy. Could even be members of your own family. But it's worth the risk. Jesus impels all of us to go out from here and to love one another. Really love one another. Go out and take the risk, brothers and sisters. It's worth it. Do what Jesus would have you do and love everyone in this world. Amen. Let us pray. Good, gracious, and merciful Lord, in the face of the rules that we establish for ourselves to help us live lives without chaos, we sometimes lose sight of what it is that the rules are intended to protect, and that is the well-being of our neighbors. Help us to see to that, to be your hands and feet in the world, to offer hugs to those people who need your hug, because we are your hands and feet in this world. Help us to love as you have loved. Help us to love as you would have us love, so that there is no one in this world, no one at all, who doesn't qualify for that love that we're the ones offering it because you offered it to us. In your name we pray. Amen.